bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Hello, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Lisa Stromquist, Associate Director, Program Development, Strategy and Engagement at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. So today's session is uh, Caring for Children and Youth with Medical Complexity. Can we do better? CAFC has facilitated the work of a complex care community of practice over the last few years and has established a really strong and engaged network of individuals and organizations. So today's presentation will focus on the outcome of their work, which is a national guideline for the management of children and youth with medical complexity through the continuum of care, and how the implementation of these recommendations can impact healthcare providers, systems, and families. But before we begin today, I'd like to take a minute to dedicate this presentation to a little girl, Sloane Pasher, who passed away on February 21st, 2018, just before her eighth birthday. Sloan's parents, Neil and Stephanie Pasher, are part of our CAFC community. And like many other special families, they have inspired healthcare providers to do better for all children with medical complexity with their love, humor, strength, and determination. So I'd like to extend deep condolences from the CAFC Complex Care Community of Practice to Sloan's parents, sisters, grandparents, and everyone else who knew and loved her. So now it's my pleasure to welcome four panelists today who have been involved in the building uh, of the COP and the development of our guideline. So Angela Era Robar is clinical nurse specialist uh, for the complex medically fragile children and youth at the IWK Health Center in Halifax. Kristen Campbell is program lead child and family at St. Elizabeth. Darren Connolly, family advisor, pediatric family resource center at uh, Children's Center uh, Children's Hospital London Health Sciences Centre, and uh, Dr. Natalie Majeur, Medical Director, the Complex Medical Care Service at CHEO. So we're just going to uh, pass the, uh, the podium over to, uh, to Kristen to get us going today. Great, thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're very excited to be here um, to, to talk to you about caring for children and youth with medical complexity, can we do better? The objectives for our presentation today are to identify the population we are talking about, understand the issues faced by children with medical complexity and their families, understand how the application of specific recommendations can impact at the system, clinical and family levels and appreciate that this field of research is still evolving and requires more study and reliable evaluation. So to start, I just want to provide you a little uh, background as to how we came to be and, and how we got here today. As Lisa mentioned, in 2011, CAFC established a National Pediatric Guidelines Collaborative using a community of practice with the goal to improve healthcare quality, safety, and efficacy, efficiency through a positive and dynamic collaboration. 
to share ideas and experiences regarding the development, implementation, and evaluation of pediatric practice guidelines. In 2012, through a national consensus process, four communities of practice were established in following priority areas, sepsis, screening, pediatric pain, transition from pediatric to adult care, and management of medically complex children through the continuum of care. The CAFC Complex Care COP was established in January 2013. So I just wanted to highlight for you some of the challenges and limitations of this work over the last a few years. Uh, defining children with medical complexity. This was a difficult task, but was critical to the work to the work we did, and that we'll share with you today. And Natalie, uh, later in the presence, presentation, will speak more to this. Consensus. We needed to establish a process required to move the work forward. This was done through response to emails, requests, and this, this was a challenge um, as everyone's doing this on their own time. And so this presented uh, a, lo a lot of work for us, and, um, but anyway, it, it, it worked out. COP fatigue, ongoing management, commitment to timelines, work above and beyond the professional demands. So as I mentioned, everyone was doing this in addition to their work, their everyday work. Limitations um, in research in this field. The, you'll see the community uh, a practice body of evidence is, is primarily composed of some quantitative studies, but mainly qualitative studies, reviews, case reports, and systematic reviews, expert opinion. This was an iterative, iterative process as new articles and studies were published annually. There was a need for evaluation and me measurement. There is currently limited research about what constitute best practices in delivering care to children with medical com complexity. There is a need for defined outcomes, measurement of outcomes to define program success and to promote ongoing quality improvement. And what we learned, there is no hard, hard evidence in the literature favoring one model of care versus another. A lot of work has been done to date and we believe overall it is a good document and we are excited to share these guidelines with you today. Uh, now I will turn it over to Natalie. Thank you. Um, so along the, um, the work uh, of the last few years with this COP, there has been a number of different initiatives and many of the members that are part of the uh, community of practice are also members of other initiatives. And I just wanted to highlight some of them that are driving some, some research uh, studies, um, um, such as the uh, Complex Care for Kids in Ontario, also called the CCKO, which is a province-wide care coordination model that is developing at the current time. And it is also aligned with uh, a research initiative. Also, along the last few years, um, the network has, has participated into an application through uh, a, a child uh, through um, CIHR SPORE um, grant for a research network, and many of the team members are also um, working with Childbright. Uh, which is an organization for children with neuro neurodisability and are within the work looking at uh, complex care intervention, more specifically to the high-risk neonates population. And there are many of the members are involved in uh, also other area of the research network. The role to the CASI over the year has been, as I pointed out, knowledge translation and advocacy and um, we are really pleased today to share with you our guidelines recommendation for the Canadian standard to ensure equitable care delivery. And we would be also very um, interested in hearing feedback from uh, the members and, and, and from anyone who uh, would wish to share your thoughts on these guidelines. Looking at the healthcare for children 
overall, the majority of our population of children, they are healthy. It is recognized that 85% of the children who do experience the healthcare system, it's usually through a very short interval of time for an acute care event. However, we also recognized over time that we have a population representing about 10 to 15% that are defined as children with special healthcare needs. And this group of children represent children who have usually some form of chronic disease, such as asthma, autism, colitis, diabetes, and so on. These group of conditions have specialty clinic that are usually um, supported by multidisciplinary approach, approach and are serviced uh, in a very different manner. However, we also, over the last few years, recognized that there is a subgroup within these children with special health care needs, and this is the subgroup that we have now defined as children with medical complexity who we believe needs a special approach in the delivery of care. Next slide. So this group of children, according to a study that was done in um, Ontario by Ial Cohen, as well as um, Astrid and, and other groups, have estimated that there is a 0.7% of this children population, um, and they are defined and they share common characteristics. So these children do not have, as other disease conditions, a unifying diagnosis. And therefore, we had to, to find a way to describe and characterize these children. Overall, these are children that are technology dependent. They, are comp they have medical complex need and require expert care and they also have significant reliance on caregivers and their families. Next slide. Although recognized this is a very small group of the population, suboptimal care to this population impacts their health significantly, impacts the family's well-being and the healthcare system substantially. And as you can see, it was also identified that a third of all childhood health care spending goes to this very specific population. Half of all these child, children represent hospitalization and half all childhood death. Next slide. I want to point out this picture, um, which one I want to say, of, uh, I want to um, acknowledge um, the parents that has uh, shared this picture, and you may have seen it in a uh, presentation before or the literature, um, but as parents and, and family um, for their child have here designed who are all the providers and the different organizations that are involved in the care of their child. And I think this is a picture that we can say is worth a thousand words because it does give a perspective that a parent can no longer work to provide and coordinate and navigate a healthcare system to provide the care for their child. The impact and the challenge inherent to this population includes that as mentioned before, there are no unifying diagnosis. These children usually have multiple conditions. All must be taken into consideration when considering a treatment. The management frequently is challenged by the lack of evidence and lack of knowledge when it is newly, when, especially when it's a newly diagnosed or described condition. A quarter of these children with medical complexity experience readmissions within the first month of discharge and about 80% of these children are readmitted within two years. During hospital stay, there is also a recognized higher risk of medical errors. There's also frequently experience of fragmented care because the care of these children is across many health care organizations. Communication is very challenging and it is very difficult for families and caregivers. They do experience social isolation, stress, and more. Challenges inherent to the healthcare system includes that 
you know, many organizations are involved, including nurse, nursing agencies, rehab center, hospital. These children require care across every system, including school, primary care provider's office. However, all of these different organizations receive funding from different sources. They have different policies, mandates, and priorities, and how to align all of these organizations to ensure that well-coordinated care and, and, and address the service needs of this population. Okay, now we'll uh, turn it over to um, Darren to speak to the family journey. Hi, my name is Darren Connolly, and our son Tyler has medical complexities. Tyler is now 14, and my wife Helen and I are about 125,000 hours into our medical journey. From, from the early days, we struggled to keep um, hope alive with Tyler. It, it was a fine balance between falling in love with our little boy while training to provide 24-7 care um, for his medical complexities. Our early years were quite dark, and it took time to find our new normal. One of my favorite terms became, I don't know. Nobody really has all the answers, and somehow this little phrase seemed to open possibilities. Sometimes it is just it has just helped to create more conversation. Traveling to medical and therapy appointments was always difficult. It was so helpful to attend multiple appointments in a single day, and better yet, meetings with multiple team members at the same time. Today, Tyler is followed by the palliative team at home. The key to making this work is communication, and if needed, the ability to reach all team members quickly. We also should not mistake palliative care for something like end of life. With Tyler, we may have a week, a month, or a year, but we really just don't know. We continue to create memories with Tyler and strive to live in the moment. Life is still difficult, but I really can't imagine it any other way. Thank you. So our first recommendation has to do with identification of this population. We need to ensure that there is a process for clear identification of children and youth with medical complexity that is in place to promote equity of services. The purpose of this recommendation is to standardize the variables to uniformly identify this population across Canada while allow allowing individualization of hospital, community, program criteria and intervention or initiatives that are limited at times by capacity, program implementation process, funding opportunity, and so on. So as mentioned before, children and youth with medical complexity share four defining characteristics, and this comes from pediatrics in 2011 from Eyal Cohen and um, co-authors um, between the states in Canada. The first of the the first characteristics is the presence of one or more chronic conditions that are often multi-system and severe and that require really expert care. The second is the functional limitation that is often significant and causes the child and youth to be reliant on technology such as feeding tubes and tracheostomy. The third one is that children with medical complexity have high healthcare utilization. And when we say healthcare utilization, we don't mean just the hospital and the tertiary care. It also means doctor's office, specialists, community organizations such as nursing agency, support services from respite care, palliative care, as well as school. The care of these children is everywhere. Requiring, requiring that specialized care and services from all the different settings. The fourth is the caregiver, identifying a high healthcare service needs and really showed by this picture. Um, they, 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 this new reality for these caregivers, parents, to be the navigator, to provide that care coordination and then ensuring that they build normal life 
experience for them, for their child, and the rest of the family. These have significant social and financial impact on the family. This represents a definitional framework, but when we look at developing an initiative, a program, we need to be able to operationalize this um, definition. And the, the guidelines provide some suggestions on how to tackle this. While this is being done, there are special considerations that are discussed, and I just want to mention a few of them. The first one, as indicated, is that the care crosses hospital and community services, and therefore there needs to be integrated provision, uh, intervention, to ensure that the many stakeholders that are involved are part of the table and part of the initiation of this intervention. The second one is it is recognized that within the definition of children with medical complexity, there are existing subgroups with varying level of complexity and ensuing care needs. And what defines complexity may not just be the medical component or the technology. It may also have to do with the social values, the culture, uh, the family circumstances. So there needs to be a system in place that offers flexibility and is responsive to the care need of these various subgroups. The third one is that these children, it is recognized that the health status is dynamic. So the health of these children changes over time, and therefore the care needs also change both predictably and un unpredictably. Again, reflecting on the fact that there needs to be some flexibility and a stratification approach for these different a health state and subgroup. At last, as programs are emerging to address the spectrum of needs of these children with medical complexity, the goal should be to impact all children with medical complexity with a tiered group of intervention which are matched to the current needs. Next slide. The impact on the system and the families would be eventually standardizing a model of care, providing proactive care rather than reactive care, building some equity of services, no matter if you're in a tertiary care urban center or in the northern area or a more peripheral center, building capacity within the healthcare system, hospital, and communities. So the main reason to develop a definitional framework is to unify the identification of these children across Canada and to build and standardize the optimal model of care and ultimately provide better care and safer care. Next slide. Okay, um, so it's Angela and I'm going to speak to um, recommendations two and three. Uh, number two is capacity. We're looking at building capacity within the healthcare system to deliver coordinated care that is holistic, comprehensive, and family-centered to all children with medical complexity closer to home. Go ahead. Within this uh, recommendation, there are several steps that have been outlined, and there are different um, leaders identified who will carry some responsibilities to, um, to move this forward. One of the first uh, subsets is to develop, implement, and sustain a supportive infrastructure for the care and services designed for the CMC population and their families. This is looking at both local leadership, leadership within government sectors and interagencies such as health, education, and social community to be able to support integration and reorganization to develop a dedicated team or support staff for the care model. One of the core values is looking at the family as an equal stakeholder and participant at all levels in the development and evolution of complex care. Establishing a governance model with well-defined objectives, goals, and evaluation processes. This will also require intersectorial agreement on program format, memoranda of understanding as needed or something equivalent, and really the core elements include cultural competency, patient safety, care coordination, community, sorry, community policy, and integrated care delivery models. And again, looking at leadership from a provincial, regional, healthcare, and program management. 
Capacity also includes sustaining, uh, developing a sustainability plan that identifies complex care as a priority and includes appropriate business planning practices. We're also looking at identifying an education model required to meet the initial and ongoing education and training needs at all levels of care. And this looks at education from tertiary care centers for initial education, skill development for care providers and family, train the trainer models for skill maintenance, liaising with home care, acute care, and primary care providers for client-specific education and management, and really looking at the use of technology for continuing education and support, as well as client-specific support or consultations. As stated earlier, this population makes up 1% of the children. So maintaining um, capacity and comfort in the care and management of these complex populations is going to require ongoing support. And I'll finally, identifying and establishing the standards of clinical delivery specific for this population. We know we will require the development of standards that meet the requirements of Accreditation Canada in the following areas. Single care plan accessible to all intersectorial access, including families. A key worker model care team identified across uh, different sectors and collaboration and care coordination. In order for this to all take place, the system is going to require dedicated fiscal, human, and technological support. There needs to be an investment in continuing education for those providers at all levels of care and ongoing infrastructure, governance, and sustainable business planning. While I don't have a child with medical complexity, I work with many f families who do. And what I hear from them is that really they need consistent and equal access to care and funding interwoven in a system that works with them. As uh, some of our, uh, one of our very, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, eloquent family members has said that disabilities are now normalized. Kids with disabilities go to the same school as kids without disabilities. And integration has been wonderful to level the playing field. But what has also happened is that now that disabilities are normalized, there has been a reduction in charity funding and support for folks with disabilities. Speaking from a Nova Scotia perspective, we have, uh, you know, very, very, very rural communities. Many of the challenges that families face with discharge planning to their home communities is that the IWK is seen as the pediatric center, so that's where you go for care. We're running into reluctance from community providers when we're looking to send a child home to their home community. A lot of the concerns that we hear, either from providers or from the families, is that they are worried that the providers don't have any experience or the community doesn't have enough resources, and they've never done this before, and we don't want to be the guinea pig. This ends up creating a lot of distress within the families and with the care providers, and really uh, starting to feel uncomfortable taking their child home. Looking at this as a, a way forward, with these recommendations, ideally we'll be able to allay these fears and support these children, their families, and their providers in their home community. Go ahead. Recommendation three is about a key worker. A key worker and care team should be identified for each child with medical complexity in order to facilitate service planning and care delivery in collaboration with the family and caregiver. Key workers, um, you can describe them many ways. We've heard terms such as um, navigators, quarterbacks, um, the point of entry into the system. But really, the role of that key worker is that they are able to facilitate communication through all of the sectors. Recognizing that... Like, the individual key worker will look differently depending on the geographic location, family needs, and resource availability. The key worker is part of the care team, and because the needs 
of the dynamic changes with the uh, child's medical needs as well as their family, social, and educational needs. Um, the care, the key worker as part of that care team will be able to um, lead the family and the team through the uh, myriad of services. The identity of that key worker may change over time, and in some circumstances, there may be more than one key worker uh, identified or required at different times. The key worker support is based on the location where they receive the majority of their services. And again, as care evolves and as the needs evolve, this too may change. There are many examples and definitions for a key worker. It could be a designated cl clinician like a nurse practitioner, a clinical nurse specialist, a care coordinator, or a team like a complex care team with several roles where team members step in as required by the child and family. There's also another model that may focus on either clinical or community requirements of, of the child with structured liaison between these two areas of focus. Regardless of how the key worker role is, um, is set up, in order for it to be successful, there are five really specific uh, recommendations. The leadership alignment around the goals for the key worker program and requirements for success. The program must be designed around comp the comprehensive needs of the child and family. There needs to be a clear commitment to improving care delivery, outcomes, quality of care, and quality of life. And the program must be inclusive of all services inside and outside the health system with leadership alignment across the continuum. There needs to be agreement on specific, measurable performance requirements to support quantification of value to children, providers, and all partners involved with the organizational structure of the program, including the funders. There needs to be active engagement of all partners involved in a model, in the model of achieving, sorry, in model, including funders and families. There needs to be adequate support for that key worker team or person. The model must be built to support internal capacity and new competencies as required. There must be sufficient time allocated for collaboration amongst members of the care team, and it must be captured using dedicated plans such as Roadmap for Success. Again, speaking with families, what I'm hearing daily is that they are really looking for support, navigation, and a system that is connected. And as you saw in that first picture, there are a lot of players involved in these kids. And really looking for also some advocacy, but also empowerment. Having a single point of access for questions and concerns is fabulous. Sometimes there's worry about fragmentation of care. Speaking with one mother that I've worked with for a very long period of time, she um, refers to me as the person who knows all about her child, and his care, so just call her. Although it's helpful and reassuring for that specific mom, it may not be seen as helpful to the other caregivers at all, especially if it's the Saturday of a long weekend and I'm on vacation. Although I'm a good point person for her, due to limited access to me, the, the uh, important information about her child isn't always relayed in a timely manner. This highlights the need for shared communication so that the responsibility isn't all on one provider, but it's facilitated across the providers. And the key worker, one of their roles, is not to hold and keep all of the information, but to facilitate that communication across the system. Okay, so now I'm going to speak to recommendation four, um, the care plan. So the care plan, develop and maintain a shared single care plan with common language and clear ownership for children with medical complexity that is accessible and updated in a timely manner. The purpose of this recommendation is to outline the purpose and information required in a shared plan a plan that is created by the healthcare provider in collaboration with the family. It's collaboration across all levels, so this shared single care plan. 
the, the use of the care plan must be accessible to the family and the care team, and it must be updated. As we heard earlier in the presentation, um, the current system relies heavily on the family and caregiver to transmit information among healthcare providers, and health records are not shared. Depending on the jurisdiction, privacy regulations, and other issues unique to each setting, the plan may reside in one, or a combination of places, for example, the electronic health record in a patient portal, as a PDF filed in the patient record, or as a paper document. There needs to be flexibility in this process, but consistency in the manner of review and updates. We have included recommendations for the type of information that should be included in the recommendations uh, within our document. Currently, care plans for children with medical complexity exist for similar purposes in different sectors of care. Children in a complex care program will have a medical care plan and may have a second care plan within the community that outlines other aspects of their needs. It is beneficial to families and children if all these needs are integrated across specialties into a shared care plan that will support family-centered care and provide up-to-date information to aid in the planning and delivery of both clinical and non-clinical services for children with medical complexity and their families. Our goal is that this plan would help guide transition through the multiple settings where care is provided. The care plan should be developed and maintained by a consistent point person. As Angela mentioned uh, earlier, we're identifying that person as the key worker with input from the family and the healthcare team, including the most responsible provider, either a complex care clinic or a primary care, and should be inclusive of short and long-term goals of care. This plan needs to be family-centered, again, created in collaboration with the family and providers, and written for both families and providers. We hear from families that they have to, and Darren mentioned earlier in his journey, there's multiple um, points of contact in the schools, at home, in the hospital, and often families may we hear that they need to repeat their story. So the fifth recommendation is about family empowerment. Empower families by proactively supporting them to develop skills, competency, and confidence to comprehensively care for their child and to advocate on behalf of their child. We have eight specific recommendations around uh, this specific recommendation, and they evolve around um, making sure that parents and caregivers are provided with ample opportunity to learn about their child's condition, acquire the necessary skill to care for their child now and in the future. It also includes guidance and coaching on how to navigate the health, social, educational, and development system and access the needed resources um, to provide and to I ideally uh, by the key to be supported by the key worker and the healthcare team in in this endeavor. It also includes that families are actively involved in program development at the system level. The implication of this recommendation um, when we speak of how this impacts families and why this is important. Um, may be reflected by this example um, that we experience here um, in our in our clinic with our family. So examples of tools that and activities that have helped uh, some of these children and families is we frequently talk about providing proactive care. We organize clinic visits in advance, and the purpose of the clinic is really to do what we call problem solving and creating medical roadmap, figuring out what for the next year will be the upcoming investigation or surveillance that is required for their child before a problem happens. Or maybe to discuss and review with the child and the family a recent hospitalization and problem solve or discuss how can we prevent the actual need to hospitalization. Is there other things that could be done in the home or 
impart them with skills before they get hospitalized. Access to the key worker and the care team will help and support um, the imparting of, of this knowledge and, and, the, um, and the tools. Another example is by having access to a key worker, um, families frequently have questions and they need to access someone quite promptly. Particularly, for example, with the technologies, there's the child develops a cold, is handling well the symptoms. However, they've noted that there's now significant granulation tissue and it appears very painful. And now their child is refusing to be fed because the movement of the tube is causing pain or the child is having trouble with sleeping over the night because of pain. Having access to a key worker or the key worker can facilitate communication with the designated individual who has knowledge in this area can help this family to problem solve proactively rather than reactively. Another example that recent has happened in our clinic is we had a mom that needed to go back to work. And she felt overwhelmed by all of the planning that she required to do prior going back to work. And by the time she came to the clinic, there was four weeks left. And they had nobody, no caregiver, and this child had a trait, very special, unique need for the care of this child, communication, uh, the feedings were very particular. Um, so we worked with this family in making sure, and it wasn't just a team, we actually problem solve by bringing a, a team of, of individuals from our nursing community, as well from our palliative care team, as well as um, specialists in the uh, trig vent clinic, where what we ended up doing is providing teaching to the grandmother who was a key care provider for this child, but was so scared of changing that trach. And parents know the skill, and frequently we will say to the parents, well, you will have to teach others how to learn that skill. But this family felt culturally they could, knew, they could not do this with their grandmother. So we facilitated the education, the imparting of the skill with this grandmother, who in the end was incredible in providing the care to this young child, and mother was able to return to work. Subsequently, within two weeks, this mother was able to identify funding with the community organization, and they were able to also employ a nurse that would come in the day and help and support the care of this child for to relieve some of the, the responsibility for this grandma. So having a team with skills that makes sure that we empower family, um, having a team that works with family really makes a difference in that care provision. So the impact on the system is really to optimize the health of these children who are at risk for poor health outcomes and high, care, high health care utilization. It also helps and facilitates the communication and therefore reduces the stressors. It isn't perfect. There still is ongoing needs, but certainly it does improve it. It prevents and or address health issues timely, rapidly, efficiently, and sometimes at the right place and right time. Care management is adapted to the child and their family and sets values and priorities that are child and family driven. Next slide. Okay, so um, our sixth and final recommendation is around care transitions. So organizations providing services to children with medical complexity must have a strategy, strategy to transition between levels of healthcare in different care environments. So within transitions, we have outlined 10 specific recommendations that you will see in the document. The purpose of this recommendation is to provide guidance to improve transitions for children and families between care providers and care environments. And as Natalie uh, mentioned earlier, earlier, recognizing there is variability in the needs of these children and their families. 
The goal is that many of these guiding principles can be applied to transitions at any point along the entire continuum of care, recognizing that transitions and transfers of care may occur at multiple points in the child and family's care trajectory, for example, within the hospital, hospital to hospital, hospital to home, transition to school, and or adult care. We do know that there are risks associated with all care transitions. We hear about miscommunication between healthcare providers during transfers of care, and that can lead to serious preventable adverse events. Although there has been progress in, the year, in this area with standardizing um, handoffs, there's still complexity involved when transitioning from hospital to outpatient care, home or community within, within, with home care supports. Understanding the challenges that exist between healthcare settings because of variable structures, patient goals, culture and terminology may lead to opportunities for improved communication and processes. We also know there are social, developmental, and educational risks involved with transitions. Isolation from friends and family for both children, youth, and their caregivers has a major impact on quality of life and impacts their physical and mental health. Discharge planning needs to include plans for reintegration into communities and school and collaboration with home, health, and education system to ensure that plans are in place for medical support and interventions if required. Transis, transis, excuse me, transition of care is also included the, in the accreditation um, Canadian medicine standards. So we have included required organizational practices directly related to these standards in our document. These are common practice recommendations for effective care transitions discharge, recognizing health settings may have best practices specific to the particular client need and medical condition, for example, in home care or cardiovascular care. Some key messages we wanted to highlight that discharge planning is not a one-time event, but is a process that take place, takes place throughout the child and the family's journey. Transition and discharges need to be well planned and managed with children and families as full partners in the discharge planning process with a focus on the goal of transition. It also requires effective communication between providers, and this might be in the, the way of a case conference, but everyone needs to be full partners in the planning process. So here is the cover of our guideline, which again, we're really excited um, to be sharing this with you today. Uh, the guideline will soon be posted to the CAFSI Knowledge Exchange Network. And everyone registered for today's webinar will receive an email with the link. As we've uh, discussed today, it has six recommendations with the number of criteria under each, followed by an evidence summary, examples of care plans, and we've also tried to provide you with links to tools and other resources that you might need. So what is the message or what is the, that we want people to leave here uh, with today or your call to action? Uh, a couple of things I wanted to highlight was really um, advocacy um, for this work and for these children and families and promoting um, these guidelines um, in your organizations, it, um, if at all possible. Um, there may, you may not be able to take all of the recommendations and implement these recommendations, but there's takeaways that you might be able to um, include in uh, the work that you do. I don't know if anyone else on the panel wanted to share any thoughts with the group. Uh, Angie here. Um, my final thoughts is uh, similar to yours, Kristen. Um, there's a lot of information in the recommendations, but don't forget you're already doing good work. These guidelines and recommendations are here to help you do better work and that there's always some quick wins. Take a look at what you can do quickly um, 
what will work for your population and take those quick wins as you go. You don't have to look at this as we have to implement this book, but please, you know, look at what you can do, what's going to be applicable now and what you want to strive towards in the future. Remembering that not only does the population's needs change, so does our healthcare system. So we're going to have to be flexible moving forward. Hi, it's Darren. I would say, speaking with a singular voice, families and professionals together, and finding ways to do that and advocate um, together with with that singular voice. Thanks, and it's Natalie. Um, I I just want to reflect on the fact that again, this is a very small, unique, growing population, and suboptimal care to this population impacts greatly the health of these children, their family well-being, and the health care system substantially. These children and their family require that enhanced care delivery, and there are opportunity within our existing health care system, like Angie mentioned, quick wins to reorganize the way we deliver care and to also ensure and incorporate that concept of care coordination and integrated care continuum. Um, families are key stakeholders into these initiatives. And, and to be successful, I really think that it's important to include and involve collaboration and partnership with all of who is involved in the care of these children. Um, having an engagement and a commitment for the similar goals, there's more likelihood to be successful. Okay, so now we, um, I think at this point in time, I think we do have a few, couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, Lisa, I'll uh, look to you for that. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks to uh, all of our presenters. Uh, uh, wonderful information you shared. Uh, just a reminder for people to type their questions into the question pane. We have a few already in there. Um, just, uh, there's a um, yeah, there's a um, people are are wondering about actually the, the 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 slides themselves and the recording and all that. So that will all be made available on the Knowledge Exchange Network, and uh, you'll receive an email with a link to um, all of the resources. As well, you will receive a, an email with a link to the um, to the uh, guideline itself. It's uh, just with a graphic artist right at the moment. So um, we just have to unfortunately wait another day or two. Uh, so some other um, bigger questions uh, from Philip. Uh, how, does, uh, how does this guideline align or conflict with CCKO and the work done for children's complex care in Ontario? So I don't know if Natalie, you wanna take that or actually I have some answers to that as well, but you can go ahead first maybe Natalie. Well, I think these guidelines support what is evolving and developing within uh, the project of the CCKO. Um, I think this really help, helps in driving and building the standards. So from the CCKO perspective, right now what's happening is the implementation of a complex care of, of a model of care. Um, and, and it's also aligned with um, outcome measures and a, a whole framework of evaluation, um, which will further inform, I believe, these guidelines as well. So I, I really do see an alignment uh, in both activities. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Natalie. Um, and I know that we've we've incorporated some of the work from uh, CCKO um, into uh, the guideline itself, and uh, we've partnered uh, with uh, PCMCH uh, through some of this and and consulted. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been a great collaboration. Um, so from Catherine and. She says, as part of the guideline and the child's individualized transition plan for discharge, is there a care plan that includes transportation, either in the family vehicle, wheelchair, van, or school bus? I 
don't know if that was part of that's a good question I don't, I don't, I don't recall that yeah, I don't recall that being that specific um, in the recommendation or, or if that was specifically included so we can certainly we'll we'll, we'll look through that and maybe um, uh, as part of this work uh, you know sort of it's a living document we've as we hear back from people, what we want uh, individuals and organizations to do is, is look at uh, the guideline, uh, implement pieces that you can implement, and to see if uh, there are um, areas where certainly can be improved upon. The evidence is always changing, as we've uh, heard today. It's, a, it's a, still a, a young area for research, and uh, the population is growing, the population is aging. And uh, so we're, we're going to continue to learn and uh, these things can be can be tweaked. And, you know, we're always uh, it's great to have people bring sort of new considerations to uh, uh, to our attention. But I think that uh, some of the it wasn't specific, I think, sort of technology needs and um, and equipment needs were probably um, uh, addressed, but not specifically transportation of them. I think that's the beauty of the um, the care plan templates is that you can take them and make them into what you need. So where one child might need specifics on transportation, another may not. But that's a great question. I think transportation is one of those tough pieces for, for the families being supported. I know um, at one point I had said to... Um, to a, a group that, that didn't have a child in a wheelchair is imagine you go to the grocery store and you leave with a the grocery cart and you unload your groceries in the car, but then you need to take that grocery cart home and you need to get it into your house and you need to get it up the stairs. That's what it's like to go home with that piece of technology. So it's certainly something that that needs continued work. Great, great, uh, great point from someone who lives this. Um, we just have a, a few minutes left. I'll, I'll ask a couple of more questions here. Um, so from uh, from Marg, uh, a nurse practitioner here in London with CCKO, uh, she's asking, do the recommendations provide any guidelines on an appropriate care plan length? They are meant to be quick references, but can become quite lengthy. Uh, not that I recall off the top of my head. Um, I totally understand the question. There's so much information, you don't want it to turn into a, um, a doctoral uh, dissertation, but how to keep it um, detailed enough, but short enough. I think there's opportunity as well to individualize these care plans. Uh, you know, sometimes you have children that are so frequently into the hospital emergency care that they do need a very thorough summarized summary, whereas another child may not, um, but you can make reference to this other document, but it's a really quick snapshot of what are the important information that needs to be relayed um, to, to, um, to the providers. And, and I believe CCKO does have uh, a link to some um, the, uh, some of the uh, care plans that they are proposing, um, and there are other links, and and those are the kind of tools that we hope to build over time with this um, reference. Um, but this is going to be, as as Lisa mentioned, a, a developing and evolving document over time. But absolutely, having references to these the different type of care plans is is very important. Uh, thanks, Natalie, and uh, thanks to all of our presenters. We are at uh, the top of our hour right now, so we are going to have to close off. I appreciate uh, everybody uh, joining us this week. Uh, just uh, remember that we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m., and it's always great when you can watch uh, live as your questions and comments can really enrich the discussion. But if you can't watch the live recordings, remember they're uh, – uh, the sessions are made available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So next week on April 11th, we will be welcoming Dr. Lauren Kelly to talk about 
opioid use in pregnancy, and neonatal opioid withdrawal. So always some great stuff coming up. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope to see you back next week. Thanks, everybody.